I hope to after this lecture that the participants should be able to explain the differences between travel fatigue and jet lag, and then also to apply some of the management strategies that I will be discussing. So we will, to understand specifically jet lag, we need to look at the human circadian system. I will then cover some challenges that we have when we travel and what we can do to cope. And I will also show a practical travel scenario uh, because this is quite complicated uh, ideas that we need to, to get to. You will, you will see when we get to West and East and the land at once. And then lastly, I will con, um, conclude um, with a few slides. So if we start off with the human circadian system, the External environment does play a, a role, specifically the light dark cycle, but more importantly is the endogenous part, the so called body clock. And our master clock is situated in the hypothalamus, but we will also have central in and outputs, for example, our sleep wake cycle, uh, the cognitive performance, and of course, we have little clocks in each cell in all tissue in our bodies, including the heart, liver, muscle. And this is where we can understand that performance may be influenced if we uh, suffer from travel fatigue or jet lag. And all of these central in and outputs, as well as the peripheral in and outputs, will then affect our physiological behavior and will help us to synchronize and adapt to the environment and the changes that we experience. The light dog cycle is very important, specifically if we start to travel and we now need to advance or delay our phase. And that is because the sort of gate to our master clock is the cells in the retina, the so-called melanopsin photoreceptors. So to just try and summarize this slide, we need to remember the circadian rhythm is autonomous. Um, the rhythm can be maintained, in other words, even if we don't have external cues. Of course, we have some clock genes that will be important. And the circadian rhythm is a sort of a phase response curve uh, reacting to what we experience from the outside, and that's why it is a phase response curve. Also important, our sleep-wake cycles and people are a diurnal species. And to try and show you, we have two phases of sleep, or two processes rather. Process S, that is homeostasis, and you can see it built up during wake time, so this is now during the daytime, and then when we go to sleep, it will fade away. And the same for process C, which is driven by the circadian rhythm. And here you can see again, during daytime, it peaks and then it sort of falls off when we go to sleep. And then that very important dip in alertness, the so-called post-lunch uh, tiredness that we many times uh, experience. Also very important to remember the inter-individual variations that we uh, will have. So in your team, uh, you may have the early birds, the morning logs, or the night owls. So they may experience travel fatigue and jet lag differently. So again, I'm also pointing you to genetic variances uh, due to the circadian-related phenotypes. So what challenges do we have when we travel? And firstly, we need to understand travel fatigue and jet lag are two different entities. Travel fatigue is a temporary exhaustion, but important is that it can be acute or cumulative as we continue during the season. While for jet lag, it's a temporary impairment due to our body rhythms, our body clock being out of sync with that of our destination time zone. Travel fatigue can be associated with any long journey. We don't need to travel by plane to experience travel fatigue. While for jet lag, we need to cross time zones. So usually following rapid long distance 
transmeridian travel. And in this instance, the direction will be more important than the length of the flight. Then very important, and we will spend more time on this, the direction of travel. So usually with travel fatigue, it will be a north-south um, or south-north uh, journey that you have. But importantly, you will now suffer seasonal changes. If you, for example, travel from South Africa, where we now have winter, to Aspetar, where you have very nice hot weather. Um, for jet lag, you need to cross more than three time zones, west to east or east to west. And this is just a quick example. For example, uh, leaving London at 10 in the morning and you arrive in New York and it will be one o'clock in New York, but in London it's already six o'clock in the evening, meaning you've crossed five time zones and your body clock now need to adapt to that. So travel fatigue, uh, if it's one sort of journey, it will subside quickly after a shower or a good night's sleep. The problem is the cumulative uh, travel fatigue that athletes and team management build during a season. And this can be quite persistent and then have a big impact on your uh, team's performance and recovery. The only way that jet lag can resolve will be with resynchronization. And important to note, and we will discuss this again a bit later on, for eastward travel, more difficult for most people, it will take approximately one day per time zone crossed. And for westward travel, it's about half a day per time zone crossed. And the severity will depend on the individual and then, of course, some contributors like how frequently do you travel, what the direction and the distance of your travel was, and how long your season is. So if we now focus a bit on travel fatigue, I've already alluded to the fact that it can be acute or cumulative, and remember it is a multi-domain disturbance. It will then follow translatitudinal travel or uh, transmeridian if it is less than three time zones. And in this instance, we will have internal factors or endogenous factors and external factors. And I've discussed this um, a bit in the previous slides. The contributors, very important then, is it a short or a long journey? How long did it take you to get to your um, destination? So the travel distance. Secondly, did you travel in the morning or the evening? Remember the morning log, the night owl that I've already uh, discussed. How often do you travel across a season and what is the structure of your season? Do you need to play a midweek game um, somewhere and then on the weekend somewhere else? So all of that very important. And how much time do you have available for recovery, taking the season length? into consideration and this is referred to also look at your recovery window. If we then move on to jet lag, it's episodic, a circadian desynchronization and the same internal factors, the physical, physiological and psychological factors will come into play as well as the external factors. What is the environment that you travel to, your schedule, the types of food that you will have um, access to at your destination? And then again, you will see that I keep on referring to this, the travel direction, east, west, west, east, how many time zones did you cross? All of that important and in this instance referred to as the time zone differential. So why is the direction of travel then important? And in this slide, I try and just summarize the most important points. So if for, for both westward and eastward travel, you will have a phase shift. If you go west, now you need to delay your clock. In other words, you need to shift your clock backwards. And for most people, that will be easier and I've already mentioned it will take approximately half a day per time zone. In other words, two hours per day that you can gain if you travel westward. If you go eastward, 
And that is the more difficult part for most people because now you need to advance your clock or shift it forward. And that will take a bit longer, one day per time zone, or you can achieve a shift of one hour per day. And usually your sleep pattern will now be affected. You, if you travel west, would want to go to bed early because remember your clock is ahead of that of the destination uh, time. And it will also lead to you waking up earlier in the morning and for eastward, that will be the other way around. So if the people go to bed, you're still awake, your clock is behind. So you, you will struggle to fall asleep, but you will also then struggle to wake up if they are up and about you now in the time that you want to actually sleep at your home time. So what can we do to cope with all of these uh, problems that we suffer? Before we can cope, we first need to understand what symptoms we will experience. And with travel fatigue, it can be specifically if it is a cumulative, persistent tiredness and exhaustion. People can suffer from recurrent illness, uh, mood changes. Uh, they can feel less motivated and, of course, suffer from uh, sleep disturbances. And again, the congested schedules, the travel distances, and I've shown you here the, the example of the NBA in America, where it's across six months, where people have 41 home games and 41 away games. So you can just imagine what that will cause. And all of these will then lead to an increase of symptom severity. If we look at jet lag, you all uh, probably have suffered from this. We, we should not forget the gastrointestinal system. And one of my colleagues actually mentioned that with his team, he found that as soon as he can sort out the GIT problems, it seems if the jet lag is also better. Of course, the insomnia will now be a bigger problem as opposed to just with travel fatigue. People will feel sleepy during daytime because it's actually time for them to go to bed at home. Uh, the mental as well as physical concentration will be affected. And many of the athletes and team members can suffer from mood changes, being irritable um, and a bit disoriented. And I've already shown you the factors externally that can contribute and then remembering the internal factors that may then increase your symptom severity. Also, before we can uh, cope, we need to ha uh, know how to assess and monitor the different uh, entities. Now, the problem is for both jet lag and travel fatigue, we have a lot of subjective ratings and I've listed some of them um, in this yellow block over here. The problem is if we use too many of these tools while we travel or when we arrive at our destination, it may actually lead to sort of superficial feedback. People just tick the boxes. They don't want to do another questionnaire and it actually adds to their daily burden. So choose carefully which of the subjective ratings you are going to use and make them the shortest one that you can find effective for your team setup. What we need to remember, and we still don't have that ideal tool, we don't only want to detect the changes due to travel. You also need to take into consideration the type of sport, the personal uh, experiences of your team, as well as the social and seasonal factors. And then you, it will be ideal if we can get a score for the individual trip, the ones off trip, as well as the accumulative travel fatigue over a season. And that should then include physical, physiological and psychological. So hopefully we will get to that too uh, in the near future. For jet lag, also subjective measurements and very important because you want to assess the personal perception um, of your team. The objective markers that we have available currently, uh, the most accurate one will be your core body temperature minimum. Um, 
unfortunately impractical because you need to do rectal temperatures and I don't know of many people volunteering for that type of uh, measurement. So we do a sort of an estimate at around four o'clock in the morning. And another objective marker that you can use, dim light melatonin onset, which is about two hours before uh, you will feel uh, sleepy. And although it's a bit less accurate, it is more practical in my mind. We all know about the watches and all sorts of actigraphy that we can use. Problem is, if you try and use that during sleep time, people may uh, actually be disturbed or some of the personalities would want to know immediately the next day, how much did I sleep? And it can actually affect them. Go and look at the term orthosomnia. Uh, there's lots of discussions around that now, and that is referring to the perfectionist wanting to know exactly what happened to my sleep pattern, and then it may affect the uh, daily performance. We can also use salivary melatonin, but you can uh, just think how uh, sort of the logistical nightmare around that, and body skin temperature is not as accurate as your CBT min. Again, the ideal tool if we want to assess jet lag properly, and that is maybe why we don't have a lot of scientific evidence in this field. I'll show you a slide a bit later on. Uh, most of the studies being done in the lab and not in the real world because of the challenges that I've just explained to you. But for jet lag, we want to know why are we measuring? Is what we measure valid and reliable? Can we use it in the field? Because, as I said, mostly used in the laboratory and it is not the same as real travel. And then, of course, all of these, the cost, the time, uh, what do you actually do with the data that you are gathering and is it really practical? Now we move on at last to try and cope with our different um, entities. And I apologize, this is a, a sort of busy slide, but I refer you to uh, the publication that we had in Sports Medicine, the consensus document on management of travel fatigue and jet lag. And on this slide, I'm just sort of trying to show you that there are things that we can do before we travel, while we travel, and after travel. And in all the slides on coping, you will see that I have a lot on sleep. Sleep is for now really the mainstay of coping with both travel fatigue and management. And if you can protect your sleep and you can strategize your naps and apply sleep hygiene, it will go a long way to cope with both these conditions. I don't need to talk about illness preventions. We've had two years of COVID. I think it learned us all the lesson again, how important it is to know what vaccinations to take when traveling. You don't want people to fall ill just on arriving um, and also treating recurrent illness and remembering the gastrointestinal system. Hydration and the correct uh, food, important always before travel, during and post travel. And when we move to jet lag, where you can strategically use uh, caffeine uh, to wake you up and not too close to bedtime. Also important to synchronize training. So before and after travel for the first two days or so, you will have low moderate intensity training because you have a window of a higher risk of uh, contracting injury. And then a few other things that would be important, the planning before that will cause extra stress and can then cause more fatigue, uh, more difficult to then manage with those uh, individuals. While you travel, remember compression socks, comfortable clothing, uh, stopovers, move around, stretch, uh, all of that. And on the bottom here, I am showing you the, the consensus document that we published. If we move on to jet lag management and on this and the next slide, I'm going to try and just sort of look at it generally and during flight. And then I will have a summary slide when we arrive. 
So very important, and I've shown you on that slide where I discussed circadian rhythm, that light is quite important. It's the most potent time cue we have to try and uh, advance or delay our body clock. And I'm specifically showing you blue light and amber lenses because blue light will stimulate. And remember, that will refer to your iPad, your phone, uh, watching movies while flying, all of that very important if you want to try and strategize the sleep for, for your team. And you will sometimes see people walking around with uh, sunglasses with amber lenses because that block the light. And on a slide uh, going forward, I will show you the importance of that. During the flight, Natural light is better if you can sit next to the window if you need natural light and avoid screen time. The problem is, and I've just experienced it myself now, on my way to San Diego for the American College of Sports Medicine, the airlines actually predict what you do. Um, I was on a daytime flight back home from San Diego, going to Frankfurt, and they made the cabin dark. So when I opened my window, the whole cabin sort of lit up and the air hostess said, please close your window. And I was like, it's that time, I don't want to sleep. But they, wa they want to uh, put people to sleep and you will also remember that they make the plane cold because if your core body temperature is low, you will fall sleepy. So they're actually not helping us to sort of try and adapt our body clocks while we are traveling. Now, sleep before you go bank sleep you can try and and uh, sort of strategize so then when you're going to fly west for three days before you leave you can move your sleep one hour later per day and then for eastward travel one hour earlier per day you can't really do it for more than three days before because then it will become impractical and you will need to go to bed at say one o'clock um, during the afternoon, which is just not uh, feasible. During the flight, um, although the group didn't reach a consensus, the majority did feel that it's better to, during the flight, go to sleep during night time at your home zone because you still sort of anchor to home and you will feel tired when it's time for you to go to sleep. Uh, probably then better to do. Just keep your watch on home time, sleep while it is night time at your home zone. And then once you arrive, you can adapt to the destination time. Avoid caffeine and alcohol uh, during flight and again, the electronic equipment that I've alluded to. There are papers coming out now on exercise and the effect on the circadian rhythm. Uh, and also more scientific evidence on the timing and duration and intensity, but it really is just starting uh, to be uh, researched. We all know that during flight, we should move around frequently and use compression socks and stretch whenever you can. And fortunately, um, on the nutrition side, we don't really have any good evidence. You can go and look at the anti-jet lag diets that have been published. Uh, the papers are flawed with the methodology, uh, you know, not having control groups, allowing people to actually do what they wanted uh, to, not giving them uh, strategies to follow. What we now advise, again, you will see the alcohol and the caffeine, definitely not at night time. And of course, during the flight, you should take enough uh, fluids. And unfortunately, probably your meal times will be that of the flight uh, schedule, unless um, you can organize something else. Then melatonin, we need to remember it can both shift our face, but it can also put us to sleep. Uh, the problem is the product quality that may be a concern in some countries and also the different dosages that is available in uh, different countries. One can consider to use it, but remember never ever just a first time use on your way to a big tournament or competition. This is sort of something that you need to try and test many times before you will know the effect and also it may differ on um, in different um, individuals. 
sleeping aids, I'm referring to short acting sleeping tablets like, uh, for example, uh, Zolpidem, again showing you melatonin, and that may help with daytime uh, somnolence. But if you also like with melatonin, decide to use uh, sleeping tablets, you need to make sure that the individual actually won't have any adverse events. And then also very important that if you give sleeping tablets, they need to have enough time to sleep. Otherwise, um, it will actually just cause more problems than any uh, benefits. And then some new kits on the block, the melatonin agonists, Remeltium, Tassimeltium, we know about circadian, the so-called so prolonged release, melatonin, uh, also agomelatin, that is a melatonergic antidepressant. But all of these drugs have not been tested in athletes. And its uh, sort of main indication is not for, for jet lag. It's for people really struggling with uh, mood disorders and um, sleeping problems. So going forward, we need to, to test these medicines in our athlete population. Stimulants for the athlete group mostly banned and uh, caffeine in certain dosages we can allow, but again, you need to uh, do that strategically. Then we have some uh, VIP antagonists and sick one suppression, and it's now moving into eye drops that we can use uh, to try and help with our face adaptation, but this is really very experimental. And remember to always comply to the world's anti-doping regulations. So if I can summarize what we probably can try once we arrived on, um, you know, wherever we, we, we went to, this diagram to the right of my slide, the green, your CBT min, you will recall I said at approximately four, so four to six. And the blue blocks will be to try and delay your clock and the orange clock, uh, blocks to try and advance your clock. So if we firstly look at trying to use light to shift your clock um, quicker, if you flew west, you now want to delay your body clock and you want to get light exposure in the three hours before your core body temperature minimum, which is sitting at four to six in the morning, and that is now at um, home time. So you can see that going west, your light exposure will be in the evening that you will need to use. And for going east, it will be in the early morning hours, in the three hours post your CBT min. For melatonin, it will be the opposite. Going west, you will now use melatonin after your CBT min in the early morning hours and melatonin almost 12 hours before your CBT min. So in the midday to early afternoon of uh, the previous day. A general rule, but of course it will depend on the number of time zones crossed. And again, you can see it on this diagram. If you go west, you will have light exposure in the early evening and melatonin in the early morning. Look at the time frame over here. And if you go east, you will have light in the early morning and you will have melatonin round about here early uh, late afternoon early evening if we move to exercise you don't want to have that too close to bedtime remember i said the first two or three days perhaps reduce the intensity and it is a good plan to try and coincide your exercise sessions with the times that you need light exposure sleep uh, strategic naps important uh, if you go napping you want to either have a nap of shorter than 20 minutes or up to about 90 minutes because remember one sleep cycle is about 90 minutes if you go to uh, take a nap for about 40 minutes you will feel groggy because you didn't go through all your uh, sleep stages and then we've spoken on 
the importance of meals. So for the destination time zone, all of this will still be important. And remember, you can use your macronutrients to try and to help with alertness or sleepiness. The proteins will more help your team to be alert and the carbohydrates and fats can help them to feel more sleepy. But very importantly, do we really have any evidence for all these interventions that I am proposing? And looking, you will see that I have green, yellow and yellow blocks. The green will be the normal population and the yellow block, the athlete population. So if we look at light, we for the normal population have good evidence. For the athlete population, the grade of evidence is low. For sleep, Again, the same low evidence in the athlete population. For exercise, we don't have good evidence for any of the populations. The normal or the athlete population uh, evidence, um, very low. Nutrition, the same, very low evidence. And for melatonin, in the normal population, we have some evidence, but unfortunately, again, in the athlete population very low evidence and I'm referring you to the systematic review that we published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine in 2020 on this uh, evidence in the athlete population. So if we now move over to the fun part, the travel scenario, we're going to fly east. Uh, I am flying from Johannesburg to Beijing. What is important? We need to have at least a choice uh, for us to apply our strategies. So we need to take into consideration flight duration, the layover, when you will arrive, what your home time is when you arrive, and of course, what the time difference is. So for both these options, the total flight time will be approximately 20 hours. With the layover, you can see that there's a problem with option two because you're going to sit over for a very long time. And you don't want to have too short layovers because that will add to anxiety and too long flight uh, layovers will uh, lead to fatigue and uh, frustration. And then remembering all the strategies that we've discussed that you, when you go east, you need to advance your body clock. It will take approximately one day per time zone crossed taking into consideration your core body temperature minimum and when you need light exposure and avoidance, just to remind ourselves, we want light exposure after our core body temperature minimum and avoid it before our CBT min. And now you, on the next figure, you will see why this is important. This is now day one, you're arriving, your core body temperature minimum because of this time difference is sitting at 10 o'clock, the destination time zone. And you now need to strategize your light exposure. The maximum advantage will be in the three hours immediately after, but you can get some advantage six hours after your CBT min. And this is important to plan your arrival time. And you can see with these two options, they quite close. We decided this is not a good option because of the long layover. So we will opt for that. And that will allow you to still arrive just within that advantage of getting some light exposure. And then you will move into a dead time. So that won't really have any effect. But you don't want to arrive over here when you need to not get light um, exposure. You know how it is at the airports, um, and at least you have all of those um, ambulance uh, sand losses that you can use. It will really have a disadvantage because your clock will now start to shift uh, to the other way. And to just remind us, and uh, you now need to, to follow this very carefully. Uh, again, reminding as going eastward, you want to advance your body clock, resynchronize at approximately one day per time zone. Now the color codes on, on this uh, watch, the orange is your time. You just arrived. Sorry, the, 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 that's the local time. It's the people living in uh, Beijing and you are the traveler, 
the, the light blue purple color. And if you look at this now, this is you, the purple, you can see that you will want to go to sleep. Say you go to bed at 10 at night and wake up at 6. But look at what the local time is. It's now 5 o'clock in the morning for them. They're starting to wake up and you now want to go to sleep. So we need to realign this clock of ours. And you can now just look at this red arrows over here because you remember want to advance your body clock. So you need to now shift your body clock seven hours forward. And if you just sort of look at that red arrow, you can see now the clock is moving it looks like it's going the wrong way around, but it is actually advancing. And now you've at um, at aligned your clock. And this will take you approximately seven days because it was a seven hour time zone difference on this clock. But what we can see is that now the sleeping times are aligned and as is the CBT min and the dim light melatonin onset. So to conclude all the things that we've discussed this morning, we need to remember the human circadian system, which is a 24 hour endogenous mechanism, but it can be affected by um, cues from the outside, specifically the light dark cycle. It can have effects um, and it actually coordinates physical as well as mental and behavior changes. And we have the inter and intra individual differences. Remembering travel fatigue, and fortunately, we don't really have original research to sort of back the interventions that I've proposed to, to manage travel fatigue. Um, and all the studies we have available are limited to opinions and collective experiences. Important, remember that recovery window that will depend on the distance uh, that you traveled, how often you travel, uh, the length of the season, all of those factors coming into play in managing travel fatigue. And also remember that you can do interventions before, during and after uh, your travel. Moving on to jet lag, that will start when you've traveled rapidly across more than three time zones and jet lag is caused by uh, desynchronization. In other words, your body clock being out of sync with that of the destination time zone. For now, the most uh, sort of practical uh, objective measurements that we can use, dim light melatonin onset and uh, CBT min, to just determine how uh, disturbed the body signals are. It is potentially modifiable with the interventions that I've shown you. Um, and we are dealing with controllable and uncontrollable factors. The strategies, unfortunately, again, very limited evidence. Um, and the challenges to determine the phase, so we will take estimations, but very important, sleep preservation, uh, taking that uh, strategic nap, applying light when you need it or avoiding it to try and adapt your body clock, melatonin, still some question marks unless you know uh, the people can endure it, and then also using exercise strategically. In the end, this is all about meticulous planning, and it is really a challenging um, environment, but very important for all our athletes. So I thank you. This is my hometown. This is where I work. Our athletes, the so-called uh, stripe generation, we fondly call them tuckies. Uh, th this is my team. Uh, we have some nice wildlife uh, close to where we live. Um, so I thank you for attending. And I invite you all to our conference. I think it may be a challenge because I know you have an important event with the FIFA uh, World Cup, but uh, the, the SASMA conference will be in Pretoria, uh, close to our university, and I will be happy to show you around if you have the time to join us. Thank you very much. <laughs>